distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is an absolute pleasure to have been invited by the Affinity Intercultural Foundation to offer a few remarks at this evening's IFTA dinner. I too wish at the outset to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to Natalie Ahmet for his moving and inspirational welcome to country. Thank you, Natalie. Tonight's IFTAR is an important opportunity for members of the community, both Muslim and non-Muslim, to come together and share a meal to talk and to recognise the significance of this time for our Muslim friends and colleagues. Because of this, I'll try to be brief, something that lawyers occasionally find difficult to do. I don't want to distract from the company, the conversation, and the savouring of the wonderful food. Um, I must say, unlike Dr. Jeff Lee, I won't need a second dinner tonight. Uh, from what I understand, Ramadan and the Iftar are special times in the Islamic community. There are rites and traditions, some of which have been passed down through generations, like a special recipe or particular sweets. But while each family and culture brings difference and diversity to their practice of Ramadan, there is a significant commonality in the ritual observed. It is sobering to ref reflect on the fact that every day this month, there have been over half a million people around the country performing the same rites and breaking bread together at the same time in their various homes, communities, towns and cities. The Muslim community in Australia has a long and proud history. From the early 1700s, Muslim fishermen from Indonesia made annual voyages to the northern parts of Australia and a trading relation developed between the communities living there, Islamic motives have been identified in some North Indigenous Australian mythology and that in, mor in mortuary cemetery, um, ceremonies in the community of Galawunka in the, on the Echo Island, for example, there is reference to the dreaming figure, Wathilda Wathilda, and an adoption of the Arabic phrase meaning God the Exalted. The first official Australian Muslim settlement was in the early 1860s, when thousands of Cameleers, mostly from Afghanistan, worked the inhospitable inland tracks, transporting supplies and contributing enormously to economic growth in that area. Australia's first mosque was constructed in the outback of South Australia, in the town of Maree during that time. While the nature of the migration has shifted through the decades, multicultural diversity has been an enduring theme of Australia's growth. Nearly half of all Australians are either born overseas or at least have one parent born overseas. This diversity culminates in, in nights like this one. It is a wonderful thing that in this country, everyone is welcome to celebrate their religious traditions, whatever they may be, and that we have the freedom to share these traditions with others. In doing so, we can strengthen the ties between our various communities. This is of particular importance in the current climate of in increasing fear and distrust of people who are different to us, whether it is different cultures, ethnicities or religions. These gestures are important at a time when some voices in our society use their position to, to stoke mistrust rather than quell it. This distrust is something I want to focus on tonight because it is a phenomenon that has taken hold of our society more broadly. The 2018 Edelman Trust Barometer, a global survey on institutional trust, registers declines in Australia in public confidence in government, media, business and even non-governmental organisations. All four are at a five-year low and all four are below 50% trust. That is, that they are more distrusted than trusted. It is not clear from the survey the extent to which this distrust in government extends to the judiciary. Nevertheless, the phenomenon is of concern to me as a member of the judicial branch of government. Public confidence in the courts is a guiding principle in relation to the conduct of individual judges and the institutional conduct of the courts. This is because of the principle stated by Alexander Hamilton that the legislature controls the money and the executive controls the force, but the judiciary controls neither. 
the general acceptance of judicial decisions essential to the maintenance of the rule of law in a liberal democracy relies on confidence, not coercion. So Jared Brennan made the same point over 12 years ago that in order to maintain the rule of law in a free and, co in a free and confident nation, the judi judiciary must meet four requirements. It must be impartial in and independent. It must be competent in the law. It must have the confidence of the people and it must be reasonably accessible to those who have a genuine need for its remedies. The people who must have confidence in the courts includes those who are culturally, religiously or linguistically diverse, those without access to financial resources and those subject to disabilities. Judicial officers are required by oath to do right to all manner of people without fear or favour, affection or ill will. This precept reflects the fundamental goal of the legal system to give equal access and protection regardless of race, ethnicity, language, socio-economic status, political opinion, gender or sexual orientation. The four requirements that Sir Gerard Brennan mentioned all have particular application when it comes to the interaction of minority communities with the justice system. In regard to the first requirement, one aspect of impartiality is that the judiciary possesses knowledge of the unique ways in which people might be disadvantaged within the legal system. In regard to the second, part of developing the law to answer the needs of society requires that we develop more inclusive procedures. The first requirement speaks for itself. Like all people, culturally and linguistically diverse, Australians, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, have a genuine need for the, for the protection of the law and must be provided with reasonable access to it. There are two important points that I want to pause and make note of in this con context. First, it is important not to confuse confidence with popularity. Judicial decisions may sometimes displease the public, even a majority of the public, but the trust I am talking about is the trust the courts will pursue justice, not applause. Secondly, while the courts must strive to adequately serve all members of the public, this commitment is premised on the legitimacy of the laws of parliament and the supremacy of the rule of law. When I use that phrase, I'm referring to the idea that everyone is both bound by the law and entitled to the benefit of the law. With that in mind, I want to outline four ways I think we can work to combating this crisis of trust, at least in terms of the judiciary, and particularly from the perspective of the culturally and religiously diverse. One of the first steps in ensuring that the legal profession system is viewed as legitimate for all perspectives. The Australian National Limits Council has been invaluable in putting out guidelines that explain the interaction between religious obligations and legal obligations. They have explained, for example, the obligation of compliance with the laws of a country of resident on a Muslim under the Holy Quran. In response to some community confusion on what, whether Muslims can, consistent with their religious obligations, observe procedures in court, the council took the step of issuing an explanatory note. They stated, and I quote, there is no prohibition or restraint on a Muslim standing up for magistrates or judge as a sign of respect to the court, explaining their position by reference to religious authorities. This document was enormously helpful to the judiciary and I think to the Muslim community in clarifying an issue that is raised quite unnecessary and um, at least on the part of the judiciary, some hysterical concern. It was also one of the myriad ways in which the Muslim community has helped foster trust in the community. It is not just the case that these efforts must come from within. The courts must also work to gain the community's trust. And this is of particular importance with communities that traditionally have had poor relations with the justice system such as, for example, Indigenous people. One way that has been formally addressed by the courts is through the Equality Before the Law Bench Book, the first edition of which was launched by my predecessor, the Honourable Jim Spiegelman. It embodies our recognition that injustice adheres as much in treating uniques the same as it does treating the same people differently. The Bench Book explains that judicial officers may need to adapt 
the conduct of court proceedings to ensure that individuals receive a fair hearing. For example, by employing a different style of communication for someone with poor English, using appropriate terminology so as not to cause offence, or being able to understand a culturally specific practice that might influence a person's behaviour in court, so that judgment of their credibility, for example, is not based on misunderstanding cultural differences. The court has also worked to build trust in more informal settings. For the last seven years, judges of the Supreme Court, other courts and members of the profession have attended a survey at the Auburn Gallipoli Mosque to mark the opening of the new law term. Like this evening's iftar, the service at Auburn is an occasion to celebrate the diversity of both the legal profession and our society more broadly. It also provides an opportunity for members of the judiciary and the profession to learn more about the Islamic faith. I know many judges and their staff look forward to the service as an important annual event on the court's calendar. There is always great excitement about meeting members of the community, touring the mosque, and I must confess, sampling the array of foods that are so generously on offer after the service. Finally, and importantly, trust in the judiciary requires that it reflects the diversity of the society it purports to serve. Former High Court Justice Michael McHugh has observed that when a court is culturally and socially homogenous, it is less likely to command public confidence in the impartiality of the institution. Confidence in the courts and in the legal profession more generally will strengthen as the breadth of those practising in the law increasingly reflects the diverse makeup of our communities. Now, it would be impossible and irresponsible to deny that diversity, both in terms of gender and culture, con continues to be a trial for the legal profession. It is plain that gracing the benches of most of the courts in this country, there are many judges who look like me, albeit probably better looking, than any, anyone else in the community. We have, of course, come a long way. This year marks the 100th anniversary of women being admitted to the profession in this state, following a tireless campaign on behalf of Ada Evans, the first female law graduate who was prohibited from practising under the laws of her time. A few years ago, I had the privilege of providing over a ceremony which saw the first Indigenous person appointed a senior counsel. In 2016, Victoria appointed the first Muslim ma woman to the bench, Her Honour Magistrate Lynx Mahood, who is from Sri Lankan background, had worked for both the Victorian Women's Legal Service and the Aboriginal Legal Service prior to becoming a barrister. Finally, each month, I preside over ceremonies in which new, new lawyers are formally admitted to the profession and witness firsthand the increasingly diverse profile of the profession with each new wave of admit admittees. Of course, success in the law should always depend on merit and nothing else. However, it is important to heed the words of Dame Brenda Hale that the word merit only seems to emerge when the appointment of women and other non-standard candidates is being discussed. And it should be noted that the idea of what constitutes merit is itself debatable and often highly subjective. At its worst, it's simply the tendency to see merit in those who exhibit the same qualities as ourselves and can result in a perpetuation of homogeneity in hiring or appointments. The fallacy was highlighted during a House of Lords Committee discussion on judicial appointments. Lord McNally was asked about merit and responded, I have only one problem about merit criteria. It is often deployed by people who, when you scratch the surface, are really talking about chaps like us. Research from the Australian National University confirms the difficulties often faced by persons from diverse backgrounds, finding that, finding that job applicants with non-Anglo names had to submit more resumes to be offered an interview. For example, Chinese applicants had to submit 66% 60, more applicants, and people of Middle Eastern background had to submit 64% more. Discrimination relating to social class, gender and background can be insidious, rearing its head in simple statements that someone was, to use one of the old cliches, not a good fit, to explain vague feelings that are in fact based on unrecognised biases. In another study done by the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, it was revealed that Asian Australians account for almost 10% of the Australian population 
and yet only 0.8% of the judiciary. Studies like that evidence the need to continue to support programs that encourage diversity and combat biases, both overt and more commonly these days, fortunately, unconscious. This is important in the legal profession because the law underpins the everyday conduct of individuals, of business and of government. It must reflect a diverse range of individuals and views, and it can only do this if it is infused with diversity from top to bottom. When diversity of values and backgrounds are reflected in those who administer, uphold and defend our laws, this inevitably improves trust and confidence in the judiciary, the law and lawyers. I'd like to finish today by emphasising that we must maintain our commitment to these measures and continue to vocally celebrate multiculturalism in this country. There is an increasing pressure to abandon such ideals and suggestions from various corners that they lack benefit or value. They do not. To the contrary, they are fundamental in turning around the tide of distrust, both in institutions and between communities, that threatens to take hold of our community. Events like tonight, and indeed the whole month of Ramadan, are an opportunity to reaffirm such commitment. While this month is a time for deepening faith, it is also a time to be spent with a broader community, strengthening social ties. Sharing a meal with people from different backgrounds goes a long way to quelling distrust of difference and instead promoting mutual respect and understanding. I look forward to learning more and gaining a deeper understanding of the tradition of Ramaban this evening, whether they be universal or unique to your respective families. Thank you for the opportunity to join in tonight's dinner and I extend my best wishes to you and your family during this holy month. Ramadan Mubarak.